There are three matters of urgency dominating our lives at this moment. One global, one national, and one personal. The global is the pandemic. Some of you may remember the moment you heard the term coronavirus. I was at Stephen Wise Temple in mid-March when we thought it better to work from home for a while. As I turned to close my office door, I recall thinking, should I take my plant? It will be fine. It's got enough water for the week. The future of this pandemic is uncertain and great passions fill the air, especially in the discussion between opening up and locking down. You know the general views. If we stay locked down and people are vigilant, there will be fewer cases and therefore fewer hospitalizations and ultimately fewer deaths. Others see it differently. They're not able to work, never have so many people lost jobs in such a short period, they have a small nail salon or work in a hotel, and despite government help, they're not able to support their family. Savings have dwindled and they're suffering and depressed. And parents are losing sleep about the impact of their children, in some cases, because they're not being in school. There is disagreement, indeed anger, but almost everyone agrees we are in the same boat. May I suggest we are not in the same boat, rather, we are in the same storm. There are many different boats. If you're grieving the loss of a loved one or if someone you love is on a ventilator, you're in one boat. If you have a compromised immune system, you're in another boat. If you've lost your job or had a cut in salary, if you're in line waiting to receive food for your family or a single parent trying to work, you're in another boat. If your business had to close and you're on the verge of financial collapse, that is another boat. Or if your mother or father or grandparent is in a nursing facility and you've not been able to see them for months, well, that is yet another boat. We can sympathize with others, but it is virtually impossible to fully feel, to fully empathize with what others in other boats are facing. And here's why this is vital. The more we can put ourselves in the other person's boat, the less likely we are to demonize those with whom we disagree. Someone may hold a very perspective than we do that does not make them selfish or people of ill will. They are likely just as decent as you and me. The pandemic should teach us Life is hard and unpredictable. Until now, we in the Western world have suffered less than any generation in world history. In fact, we've come to expect life to be smooth. The lesson that we can, indeed the lesson we should internalize, always be grateful. You will be a better and a happier person. Most people don't learn this until it's too late. Rabbi Joseph Telushkin shares that one of the saddest experiences he has is when visiting someone who has suffered an irreparable loss, a death, or an illness where there's not likely to be a recovery. They'll say, if things could only go back to how they used to be, I'd be so happy. But Rabbi Telushkin adds, I knew them when things were the way they used to be, and they weren't happy. So today, make a promise to yourself. I will not wait until I lose the good things in my life to be grateful for having them. I will look at what I have now, not what I hope to have. If you're waiting to get into that grad school, to buy that car, to get that promotion or that job, to go on that vacation, that is a prescription for unhappiness. It's good to have aspirations. The key is to find a way to be grateful for everything you do have every day. And that's a great lesson for the high holidays. Which takes me to the second matter of urgency, which is national. 
Not since the 1960s has there been so much discussion about race in this country. The Torah teaches us about race in the very first chapters with Adam and Eve. We know something of their relationship. We know what they did when God told Adam he could eat from every tree of the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and bad. Spoiler alert, they ate. We know their fashion preferences. Apparently fig leaves and loin clothes were in vogue, but to be truthful, the options were limited. But there's one thing that we don't know about Adam and Eve. We don't know their color. And the rabbis of the Talmud thoughtfully took notice of that. And their insight is profound. They teach in the Mishnah that because we are all descendants of Adam and Eve, whose skin color we don't know, shelo yomar adam lechavero, abba gadol me'avicha. No one can claim that their ancestry, including their race, is superior to another. It's vital to acknowledge the deep moral flaw of slavery and racism that ravaged our nation. And whenever racism continues in our country, it must be rooted out. And while our nation searches its soul on these days of introspection, we should do the same as individuals. We must ask ourselves if and when we act with prejudice or bias. At the same time, the United States is the first and only country founded on Judeo-Christian values, and it became the most racially and ethnically varied country in world history. A hallmark of our nation has been a desire for people of every background to work together in our aspiration for a greater good. That is among the many reasons it is a blessing to live in America. If I could emblazon one thought about race to memory, it would be the words of Dr. Viktor Frankl, survivor of three concentration camps, who wrote, there are two races of men in this world, but only these two, the race of the decent man and the race of the indecent man. Both are found everywhere. This was embodied in Reverend Martin Luther King's words. He dreamt of a day when people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. The Torah's goal, the Talmud's goal, Dr. Franker's goal, and Reverend King's goal were identical. Color should be irrelevant. There should be one overriding trait, character. If the first urgency is global, the second national, the third urgency is personal. On these days, every one of us is to see our lives and our future in the balance. On Rosh Hashanah it is written and on Yom Kippur it is sealed. How many will pass away and how many shall be born? Who shall live and who shall die? Our future is uncertain. And if that isn't enough, we are on trial. Our machsor reads, the day of judgment has arrived. How many shall leave this world and how many shall be born? Who shall live and who shall die? Who by fire, by water, by sword, by beast, by famine, by thirst, who by earthquake and who by magefa, plague. How many times did you and I read plague and simply ignore it? Plagues are ancient. We don't have plagues. We don't die by sword, by beast, by famine or thirst. They're ancient too, right? But our people did face these dangers almost all the time. They knew life was fragile. And for the first time, many of this generation feel that sense of fragility. As I record these words, over 178,000 people have died of this virus in the United States, and many who felt secure feel vulnerable. Many stay home or venture out selectively, limiting human contact. It changed the way we live. And yet, 
if the pandemic helps us not to take life for granted, that will be a blessing amidst the pain. God willing, there will soon be a cure or a vaccine. And when the time comes and we return to embracing friends, enjoying restaurants, attending sporting events, don't take any of it for granted. And don't take the people in your life for granted. And don't take coming to synagogue for granted. One of the blessings of the High Holidays is they focus us on the deepest questions in life. Who am I and what can I become? This is the time to have a cheshbon chanefesh, a dive into our soul and to pray. And if you find it difficult to pray watching a computer screen or a television monitor, then find some time today to go into a room alone. Turn towards Jerusalem and with all your heart, pray. Pray to God that you will find ways to be better in the coming year. And pray that God will bless those you love. Open your soul. Stand emotionally bare before the Almighty. And when the shofar blasts at the end of Yom Kippur, you will feel fresh, ready to embrace the future. God created Yom Kippur. It's in the Torah. You know what that means? It means God expected us to sin. And that's a powerful thought. And God gave us the ability to make tshuva, to turn our lives around. It's a profound lesson to each of us. Our past does not have to define us or confine us. I may have gotten it wrong in the past, but I will grow from my mistakes. It is the greatest statement of optimism and confidence that I can imagine. I will become a better person, and the next chapter of my life will be the best one in my book of life. Even if I've lost faith in myself, God has not. God has faith in me. Embrace that thought, and this day will have meaning beyond words. May we realize that we are navigating different boats in this storm and not demonize those who are in the other boats and have different views. May we create a world in which we ultimately see only two races, the decent and the indecent. And may God seal every one of you and your loved ones in the book of life for a year filled with good health, with joy, and with a commitment to becoming better and deeper Jews. That would be a blessing for each of us, for the Jewish people, and for our world.